everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is off to a great start. Uh, look, I got some things I need to cover here, so I'm going to move along quickly. First and foremost, if you like, approve, inspired by, encouraged by, enlightened by the information that is shared on this channel, please hit the like button, please share and subscribe. Uh, if you believe in the work that we do and the things that will be revealed through the content shared, but more importantly, the work actually done in the community, uh, if you followed for any stretch of time, you know how deeply rooted we are in actual work from research to program implementation and more. Look in the description box and show some love. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is one of those topics when you view it on the uh, when you view it on the surface, it's all cute, it's all mushy, uh, and it's exciting, and we feel recognized, especially our sisters, uh, when we uh, when when we talk about it on the surface. And when I delve into it and I begin to break it down, oftentimes I'm misunderstood, and I'm accused of. Um, woman hating or and anybody that knows me knows how much I'm in love with black sisters how much I go to bat for black sisters how much I fight for black sisters matter of fact I don't think it's anybody with any true consistency that's been around for as long as I have that's been called a simp more than I do because I definitely go to bat for the sisters uh, I don't abandon my brothers I'm a black man so I fight hard for my brothers matter of fact i actually have more intensive engagement in the community with black men but for whatever reason because i stand up for black women i'm always called a simp uh it's almost to the point now when i'm called a simp it, t it tells me that i'm loving on black women the way i should be that i am calling black men to be concerned and to be responsible i'm not giving black women passes i'm not sitting up ignoring anything that is coming from that particular space that's out of line and if there are some things out of line there are some things being pushed uh but what i am concerned about is an elevated suicide rate now i've been talking about mental health for a long time i've been telling you that's a problem for over a decade and it's largely been gone unheard unacknowledged ignored pushed to the side you know we are the masters of sweeping things under the carpet uh if you remember it was me roughly about 15 years ago that started ringing the bell up about um, childhood sexual abuse and uh, incest in the black community, specifically as it pertained to women, but how uh, prevalent it was about, upon, uh, among black men as well, even though black men are less likely to uh, actually report it. And it was this yearning at the time uh, to gain an understanding of it because I'm like either every black woman who is being who was molested as a child or the victim of incest as a child is coming to me or we got a problem. And so I started to poll other black professionals and uh, healthcare professionals and therapists. And it was. It was a, a phenomenon that was going unaddressed. It wasn't a whole lot of research out there about it. So I pushed for it. We pushed for it. And what we found out is on the liberal side, we're talking about 60% of black women haven't experienced it. On the very conservative side, over 40%. So we're talking about anywhere on a measured adjustment, 50% or more black women haven't experienced some form of childhood sexual abuse. And we're wondering why we're having problems along adulthood, but that's just the slight problem. And I've been an advocate ever since. I have written about it. I have lectured about it. I have been a therapist. I have given myself to thousands upon thousands of hours of actually therapeutic services to these black women. And so here we are again. And we're looking on the back end of this and we are talking about uh not just depression among black women but uh an increase in suicide here's and and the reason i'm actually bringing this to bear 
is because I was contacted not once but twice in less than a week by two different people about people they knew who died from suspicious overdoses that they suspect and they're both go figure in the healthcare industry not necessarily in mental health but they have to have a certain level of mental health training to be in the healthcare industry that they're in and both believe that it was suicide they both believe based off of the history of the individual in question that they simply gave up now even if that isn't true in this instance we still have a problem and the problem that i see is along the line that there is this idea of supernatural uh presence and power in black women and i believe black women are super i believe they're special i believe they're extraordinary i believe they are the most unbelievably beautiful creature on the planet and they possess an immense amount of power when they're operating within their scope of power but if like anything else you take it out of its element you weaken it if you take it out of its element you uh marginalize its power and its force and its acute ability to do what it was designed to do black women are no different and we, we got to understand we have to start asking ourselves not on the superficial level where everything is cool and everybody's walking around and everybody says all the right things and everybody's you know um doing the, I, I i you've got to be able to ask the questions one of the things that i think has made me successful in multiple areas of life but every especially in the area of what i'm able to do in helping people change their lives helping people heal helping people grow helping people do things that they want but once thought is impossible is i look beneath the surface i'm not just looking at what is being said i'm not just looking at what people are t i'm looking at causality i'm looking at where we're at and what, what am I talking about specifically? First and foremost, I'm talking about the phenomenon of the strong black woman. You've heard me talk about this before. And sisters get real upset with me when I say I cringe when I hear uh, the phrase strong black woman. Not because I have a problem with black women. I don't think they're strong. I was reared by a strong black woman. But you know what the difference is in that strong black woman? And the vast majority, I mean, the vast, vast majority, 90, 90 plus percent of what we classify as strong black women. Now, you know the difference? She had a husband. She had somebody holding her down. My great grandfather, somebody I celebrate as a strong black man. See, she wasn't out there trying to do it by herself. She wasn't out there because the world was telling her that her strength was in the fact that she's doing it by herself. You got to be very careful of how instruments uh, construct ideas. And that's what I do for I understand concepts and how concepts are created and they become the notions of our reality and our thoughts is that. There's intrinsic value in being referred to as a strong black woman, but how we define strong black woman is where the problem lies. What, what, what are you saying, Doc? What I'm saying is I don't have a problem with a strong black woman. I, 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 I think that actually every black woman at some level has an un, innate strength just to exist consistently in a world that is inherently hostile towards them. I believe that. But I believe that when we start celebrating a black woman outside of her element without consideration to what it leads to, I don't mean sit up and say we ignore the fact that these sisters are doing some unbelievable things and some, and some things that, 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 that need to be acknowledged. I say that we need to ask why they have to. See, I'm talking specifically now about single moms. And, and to a certain extent, single women. And I, I, I'm going to get to some things. It's going to take me a while to get there. But I'm going to do it relatively quick, all things considered. But I don't want to dance over this, skip over this, because people want to be entertained or people want something fast. People, we got to get out of the, the sound bite. You're not going to develop enough enough information in a soundbite 
to beat racism. You're not going to develop enough information in a soundbite to overcome and close the wealth gap. You're not going to develop enough information in a soundbite to come over generation, overcome generational uh, trauma, adverse childhood experiences, and all of the other things, mass incarceration, serial force displacement, all these things that we are simultaneously being bombarded with and think you're going to sit up. Well, that was a great five minutes. That might have got you fired up, but that's not what you need. You need awareness. We're losing because we don't understand how things work. So I'm not here to give you a bunch of sound bites. I'll stop in every now and then and throw something at you. But what I want to give you is the thing that when you sit down and look at it, you can say, well, wait a minute. Maybe if I did this, maybe I want to start you to asking questions. And see, this is one of the things that I do is research. I don't mean go look on the internet and say, well, what do they, what do they say? Because that, that, if you're not careful in how you, you conduct that search, your, your, your uh, confirmation bias will kick in and you'll be looking up for everything that you believe and you'll support your belief and you will have discovered anything. I'm talking about real true scientific research, the breaking down peer reviewed research, conducting your own studies, observing your own information. I gather so much data from, um, from social media, I can literally collect data from every place I'm on in massive numbers from what you say, what you respond to. Every time you comment on anything on a channel, on a Facebook post, on a Twitter post, on an Instagram post, whether you're, if all I got to do is type into it and I can get all of the information from that post, pull it. And I can get, I can conduct all kinds of informational studies, all kind, uh, compile all kinds of data. Here's the thing that gets me though. If I'm doing it, who do you think else? Who else do you think is doing it? Why do you think they're so effective in triggering us? Why do you think they're so effective in engineering things that move us in directions that are not conducive to our growth, to our empowerment, to our elevation? We are behind because we won't invest in research. We won't invest in programs. We won't invest in things that will allow us to overcome some of the things we're facing we are consumer minded because it's programmed into us and we are reactionary because it's programmed into us we don't know how to respond because we haven't developed the capacity and i know there there's always exceptions but i'm talking predominantly pervasively in our community what's going on so when I talk about the strong black woman, I'm not talking about her as if there's she needs to be maligned. What I'm saying is when I see a when I hear the term strong black woman, the first thing I hear, and I'm gonna tell you why I'm why is this this is so important. The first thing I think of when I hear strong black woman, here's another black woman doing something she should not be having to do. Because see, we don't use the term strong black woman to reply, I mean to refer to married black women that are doing things we might throw out black girl magic to a married black woman that's doing something but strong black woman that's reserved for that black woman that's taking care of those kids that's working those jobs that started that business that's doing all this stuff and she's playing both roles one of which she's completely not designed to take she let me t let me explain something to you ladies and men we are built completely different from a neurobiological perspective, we're built different. From a reproductive perspective, we're built different. Men work on a 24-hour biological cycle. Women work on a 28-day biological cycle. Men's brains work from the front to the back. We are built on and respond to and get the most fulfillment with what we are able to do. Specifically and most importantly with our hands. The things we're able to accomplish that from hunting to fishing. That's why you get so many guys, even though if they have these great jobs, they're out hunting, they're out fishing. Why? Because there's a certain fulfillment you get with doing what you were literally designed to do. Women left to right. Discernment. The ability to feel. The ability to see things that aren't in front of you. Men are visual. We see things that actually are there. Even we can see inside of, and I don't mean just from an optical perspective, I mean we are visionaries. That's why we can sit out and take the vision and the dream and everything else. That's why women, the first thing you should ask a man when you meet a man isn't where he works, how much he makes, what he drives, it's what's your vision? Can you give me clarity of vision? Can you tell me where, because when he gives you his vision, he's telling you where he's taking you. 
if he has a vision and he's really truly applied, if you can look at him and you can see his work ethic, work, work ethic his commitment, it, 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 he, he may be off in the timing. He, he's going to tell you, well, when this time I'm going to do this and this time I'm going to do this. And he may be off in the timing because there's just certain things you cannot prepare for. But what he's going to do is he's going to get you there. He's going to go there. And he's going to depend upon you to come in understanding his vision and lend the power of your spiritual power, especially your spiritual womb. Because see, there are things you can place in your spiritual room and give birth to that he doesn't have the power to do. That's why we're supposed to be together. That's why you cannot procreate without one another. We were meant to be together. We were meant to, meant to produce things together and then build together from what we produce. But see, we, we, we've lost that. We've lost that. Men, we need to be in the homes. We need to fight to be in the homes. Even homes we're no longer in, we need to fight. And when I say be in the home, I mean literally be present in the home. And we need to stop procreating irresponsibly and then start to think. And I can say this uh, from an honest perspective, I'm not preaching from a platform of perfection. I have been married more than once and I have children from multiple marriages. It's not easy. Number one, it makes it harder to build wealth. Number two, it makes it harder to be present the way you need to be. It, number three, it literally leaves voids and absences and it leaves that woman, if she doesn't ever find someone else to step in and fill that space, trying to do things that you're supposed to be doing. Now, sisters, I don't care how cute he is. I don't care how many packs he's got, six, eight, whatever. I don't, I, I, I don't care what he drives. He's got to have an, a, an ability to what? Care. He's, he needs to have an ability to protect. He has the, the, the ability to provide. He needs to be able to speak, but he needs to have the ability. And you need to be able through your discernment, which needs to be intact, which is a problem because you can't go through all the things that qualify you now in today's culture as a strong black woman and have your discernment intact. Why? Because the moment you start taking on masculine responsibilities, being the, the, the predominant provider, being the predominant disciplinarian, being the source of uh, 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 of identity and all the things that the man does, the operational uh, mechanisms. You're trying to mass produce uh, false, I mean, falsely or erroneously, uh, mass produce a type of energy, a type of chemistry, and a type of behavior that you're not naturally inclined to. What does that do? That takes you out of your spiritual element. Your discernment is off. So now when you meet a man, your discernment isn't on, so you can't really dictate who is he, why is he there, what's going on. And then eventually you get into the situation, and what happens? He's not who you thought he was. You become maligned, you become frustrated, you become a little upset, and you start to distrust. Because number one, you're not in the space you need to be in. Now you're left with a situation where you're trying to do something you were never designed to do and you're frustrated. And so it, it and, and, and your ability to do what you were really designed to do diminishes over, over time and you become less. Here's the problem and what happened. In both of these in instances that I was contacted about, and this isn't isolated, and this is why I'm having this conversation, uh, the women... Um, had multiple children and the people that don't care are going to sit up and say, well, they, they shouldn't have been having all the baby stuff like that. Well, they're there. And we got to ask why. See, I don't look at the surface. The easy response is, well, they chose to have those babies. Yeah. Why? Nobody wants to ask the questions because now you got to think. Now you got to go deep. What's driving? Nobody in the world that I know and I, and I literally do the best I can to really dig deep and find answers. Nobody that I know sit up and said, you know what? I'm just going to screw my life up. I'm going to go out and I'm going to purposely make the worst possible choices I could ever make in this world. I'm going to choose a man that I know is going to screw over me, cheat on me, beat on me, uh, have multiple babies by multiple women while he's with me, then turn around and leave me to raise this kid on my own. And then I'm going to turn around and do it again. That's what I'm going to do. And it's, you know, hey, sounds like a good plan to me. Nobody's doing that. So then that means there has to be something behind it. But we don't want to talk about it. Now, I've talked about it previously. we got to really look and undress what? 
uh, multi-generational trauma because if we haven't dealt with trauma everything we experience from that point we're experiencing through the paradigm or the lens of a traumatic experience even if we didn't experience it, because what we know now that trauma can be passed down what epigenetically I hope you're following me here because I'm, go I'm going somewhere. I'm trying to get us to understand we have a problem in sitting around just yap yapping and pointing fingers and standing on pedestals and talking about what, what is and what isn't. Uh, they did this. They did that. I was stupid. I guarantee you it's far too many of us that are below our performance levels to be sitting up talking about anybody. We are not performing anywhere close to what we're capable of. And it's engineered that way. It's literally by design. And we're not participating in the design. We're not participating in the plan of engineering because we don't understand how things work. We are constantly in survival mode. That means we are reacting to everything that happens to us. And we're not actively coming up with solutions. So when I sit up and I'm frustrated with the idea of strong black woman, it's not that. I'm frustrated with how we're defining her. We're defining her as the black woman who's outside of the realm of what she's literally capable and designed to do. And she's caring. Now, she may be doing a great job from the outside, but how much is it costing her? So that's what you don't get. See, everything that you step out, the more you step outside of your zone, you give away a part of yourself that you didn't have to give away. And the more you give away of yourself, the less you begin to understand, the more you start to struggle with an identity crisis, the more you start to struggle with struggle with identity crisis, the less the things you go through make sense. At some point, if the suffering simply doesn't add up, it's not justified. And that's the, and here's the worst thing that I see with our sisters. A black woman says, I'm tired. Now, and don't get me wrong, I'm going to talk about our men because our men are struggling. We got a massive spike in male suicide as well. But specifically, I'm addressing this because these women asked me to address it. And so I'm addressing it because there's a problem, Houston. There's a problem, uh, black America. There's a problem here. So what I'm saying is you got this idea that, okay, we're going to celebrate her because she's out there doing this unbelievable stuff. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge that women are out there doing more than they should, but it should be acknowledged in that vein. She's exceptionally strong, but it's destroying her. We shouldn't acknowledge it in a vein to where it, it starts to be a badge of honor. Why? Because they're killing themselves. This is how it was meant to be. This isn't how it was meant to be. It was not meant for her to carry that by herself. And we need to help her pick it up. It may not be in the traditional vein of the father who created the child in the home. But as a community, we need to lift her. We need to say, let us get those kids for a minute. Go out and take care. You cannot keep, and I'm telling you from experience, I almost died. You can't keep giving and not take care of yourself. So if you don't have, now how it works normally in a marriage is you can go all out in a marriage when you got a partner that's going all out for you. You can go out for them. You can do everything and they're going to do it for you. So two people making sure the other person is okay creates an environment where you both can put yourselves into it because nobody's going to let the other person fall. The problem is when it ain't nobody else and all you're doing is the kids and mothers will do this. Kids, 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 kids. The problem is every time that you do that and there's nothing coming back to you, you're losing yourself. And it breaks my heart because I'm watching it happen far too often and it's being praised. Oh, definitely celebrate the fact that she's out there kicking ass, but also say, wait a minute, that's not normal. What are we going to do about it? How can we change the narrative? 
Number one is we need to start socializing little black girls and little black boys the way they're supposed to. We need to develop an understanding in your young black boys of what it means to be a man long before they get there so they know what they're aspiring to. We need to have a universal understanding and a universal definition of black manhood. That needs to be an understanding that no matter where I go in this country, if I walk into an environment where black men is, I know what to expect from them because we're striving to be the same thing. I know what to hold them accountable to because we're striving to be the same thing. They know what to hold me accountable to because we are striving to be, be the same thing. We can no longer self-identify and self-define manhood based off of where we are in our lives and what we want to be and how we feel. Let me tell you something. Your bank account doesn't make you a high-value man. I don't care what, who, and what said. That doesn't make you a high-value man. You're a high-value man when your influence is felt in your home. You're a high-value man when your influence is felt. Your positive influence is felt in your community. You're a high-value man when you are protecting, when you are providing, when you are promoting and upholding and being a sense and a source of identity to the people in your life, the people you're responsible for covering. If you're not a covering, I don't care how much money you have in the bank account, you are not a high value man. If you're sitting around, it's okay to watch black women and black children suffer because they are not yours, you're not a high value man. You might, be a, you might appear to be a catch to some people who simply don't know who they are. But what we need is we need people who want to embrace the responsibility of leadership. See, that's where manhood starts. Some people who want the buck to stop with them. That's where manhood starts. Some people who aren't willing to throw out excuses no matter how tight and how tough it gets. Oh, I'm not talking about giving passes. There's some things that I know our sisters do. I know they can be disrespectful. I know they can be abrasive. I know, but you got to ask yourself again, why? Well, it's not like they've got an optimal environment. And then they're coming out of this optimal environment and saying, hell, we just bucket. They're fighting the same way black men are fighting, sisters. And black men are fighting back as early as 12. So get this understanding. It's not as simple as you want to make it. Black men are fighting as early as 12. Why? Because there's very little place for us to be us. There's very little place for us to start. When, when white boys, little Jewish boys, little white boys, little uh, uh, Italian boys, little Arab boys, when they get to a certain age, they get to start experiencing and exploring their power because there's a place made for them to do so. They get to go out into spaces and execute their power to exercise their masculinity. We don't have any space. Nothing belongs to us. Nothing's ours. And that's a part of our responsibility, but it's also been engineered. We've been engineered into poverty. So we got to engineer our way out. That doesn't happen by sitting up complaining. It doesn't happen by sitting up burning up stuff. It doesn't happen by shooting shooting up stuff. It doesn't happen by going. That's what they want us to do. They sit up and understand that if we can engineer poverty, we automatically guarantee a heightened level of criminality and violence. We guarantee it. The more frustrated a man gets, the more violent he becomes. The less the man knows about who he is, the more disturbed and upset and frustrated and um, emotionally unmanaged he becomes. Uh, something I'm going to share with you brothers. about A lot of people are talking about emotional management, emotional uh, maturity, uh, emotional intelligence. Let me explain something to you. The goal as a man isn't to suppress your emotions, it's to manage them. And they're not the same. When it, what I mean by that is suppressing your emotions is to sit up and not feel them. It's to sit up and go cold. And, but the problem is when you suppress those emotions and you go cold, you lose the connectivity to the very ones you need to be connected to. So your goal isn't to suppress the emotion your emotion is to feel it but monitor and manage the behavior see you can be upset but you can't kill everything you're upset with you can't beat up everything you're upset now there are some times you are literally going to take this physical power and prowess you have that was given to you as a man and you're going to have to use it with violence but it should be to defend something to protect something and you got to ask yourself what is worthy of protecting? And that's going to determine your manhood. Am I protecting a block I don't own or am I protecting the black women that walk down that block? 
the black children that walk down that block, the other black men that walk down that block, or I'm protecting and defending them, or am I a menace to them? Now, black to you, black sisters. We need to start embracing the traditionality of it. See, one of the things that I look at, I look at this and I'm going to say something, and, and, and this is probably going to upset some of you, but I'm going to say something because I understand where it comes from. And it sounds good, it sounds liberating, but it's working against us and it's killing the future of our children. Let me explain what I'm talking about. We are in a place where we constantly are, you know, seeing black men and black women get further and further apart and stop caring and it's engineered. I'm going to show you what I mean on, uh, on, I just showed you about black men, let's talk about black women. And I'm going to use something very superficial and petty to make the point. But you can see it across many spectrums. And I don't go to, want to go into the deeper spectrums because I don't want to open up wounds beyond what we've opened up. We've got enough on the table right now. But we talk about these over-the-top eyelashes or this extravagant makeup, this contour makeup where you look at a person, they don't look nothing like the person in the makeup when they take the makeup off. If you want to dabble up a little bit, good. Me personally, the more natural you are, the better. I'm good that way. I'm good. I want the person I'm going to be looking at. I don't want the dressed up person. But if you got to dress up and go somewhere, okay. I just don't want the person that dresses up and goes out to be unrecognizable to me when I see them. But that's what you got. But I want to talk just, just with the, 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 the lashes. I've polled, literally groups of black men for the last two years not just friends so it's not just okay age group wise i polled from 25 to 60. i'm almost at a thousand i don't have one that say they like that now here's the thing almost to a man they say they hate it but the lashes keep getting longer so then when I talk to the sisters, because I didn't just talk to the guys. All right, my sisters, I want to know what's going on with you. I see you doing your thing. Enhance something is one thing. To make it totally unrealistic to where it couldn't possibly be is starting to get into I'm not happy with me. But I'm not finna self-diagnose. I'm not finna distantly diagnose right now. What I want to talk about is what I get from women. When I sit up and say that, here's the response. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. And so all the women get together and say, but now here's the thing. Traditionally, men carry themselves to attract women. Women carry themselves to attract. Why? Because traditionally, that's how we came together. Now we've gotten to the point to where it's screw them. It's for me. So now you have an entire group of women that say to hell with impressing men. We're going to impress ourselves. Problem is, you can't do it by yourself. And when you go out there and you try to do it by yourselves, we end up with this situation that we got. We weren't meant to. We can't do it without you. I, I can't wait to get married again. Now, I'm not just going to run out and marry anybody. I haven't, you know, I haven't even come close to d doing anything. But that's not because I don't want to. It's just because I'm not moving in any place that my spirit doesn't move me. So I'm good. But that ain't what I want. I want to be married. I want to have something to be responsible for at that level because to me that's the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, now I'm not saying everybody is supposed to, but what I'm saying is far too many of us are fighting each other. Here, here's the thing. It would be one thing if everybody was saying, you know what, forget that. I ain't, you know, and women were going, I don't need you, and nobody wasn't procreating. Nobody was creating offspring. We are hating each other and birthing kids into this hatred. We're starting them out with adverse childhood experiences before they ever come out of the womb. Genetic stress. We're literally birthing traumatized kids because we don't want to heal ourselves and answer the question why I don't care if he's attracted. 
why I don't care about impressing him, why I'm not trying to, and, and men, you know, why we're sitting up saying screw her. What are the real issues behind it? And men, I'm going to get to it. I haven't gone into deep to it, but we need to talk about that. We need to literally talk about it, but we're going we're gonna to do a whole thing with the men. But what I'm trying to get here is we've got these sisters killing themselves, and they're telling you. When you go back and you look, they say, look, I love my kids. I'm not doing this because I don't love my kids. Please tell my kids I love them, and it's not their fault. This is one person who actually committed suicide and wrote a letter. Tell them it's not their fault. I'm just tired of having to wake up every day, no matter what, no matter how I feel. And, and there are going to be the people out there say, I do it every day. And what I'm saying is if you really truly search your life, how much of you have you given up? There's this idea that that's what we're put here for, especially women. You're put here to give everything you have into something else. And then those kids grow up, and guess what? They go off to school. They go get married. They start their own lives. And I know so many black women in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s who are lost because they don't have a man. And those children that they pour their lives into of starting their own lives, if they're healthy. And now they're trying to figure it out. I'm not saying be with someone who can't love you the way you deserve to be loved. I'm saying we need to be more aware of who we are so we attract people who genuinely love us in order for that to happen we have to love ourselves and can we say we truly love ourselves when we keep putting ourselves in situations that harm us oh the go-to and easy response is i love myself i'm valuable i know my worth now nah, sister that's why you've never seen me do that old male woman advice thing that these guys do or well, you shouldn't let a man do this and if he does this even now see i tell you right then and there if i've got to tell you not to let a man do something the problem isn't with the man the problem is with you and what does that mean that means you don't know who you are because i guarantee you anybody that knows their worth will demand it anything that has a value on it demands it be paid the value of its worth. You can't go out and get a Bentley for 15 bucks. I don't care how much you talk, how good your game is. I don't care what you spitting, what you laying down. You're going to pay that 175 depending on which one you get, 125 uh, 175 or even 2 depending on what you get. You're going to spend up and you're going to spend that. You're going to spend that. But when a man walks up and he spits a good game and then you sit up and you give up the goodies, you give up the cookies long before he's ever really truly given you the in, uh, the uh, indication that he really, really, truly wants to be with you. Now he's laid it down. He's done all this and now you're all in it and going on. You, 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 you never establish value. You, you let your feelings leave for you because you were searching for something. You let your feelings leave for you because you were yearning for something. Maybe it was yearning for the, the love of dad you never got. Or maybe you were learning for the dad that died. Or maybe you are yearning for the dad that went off. Or, or maybe it's a, it, it's a relationship in the past that you never got. But something you're yearning for that you go out and you seek and you put yourself out before you receive. You should feel covered and protected before you ever open up to a man. The first level of your value should be satisfied, and that's covered and then protected. Uh, all the provider stuff, if he's really a man and he cares about you, he'll figure out a way to provide for you, even if he doesn't have it now. The beautiful thing of a man is his sexual market value increases as he ages while yours decreases. So he's got time to become. But the problem is you've got to know who you are. And so my whole thing is these sisters are out there and then they're going through this. And let me explain something to you. For those of you, I'll never do this. I would never do this. Let me tell you something. There's a difference from being sad and being clinically depressed. I cannot stress it enough. I'm not going to go into a long, drawn-out explanation. But there are some variables you cannot possibly understand if you've never been there. Being sad is one thing. Being clinically depressed is an entirely different thing. Being in a place 
where you're searching and you're trying to dig yourself out of darkness and no matter what you do every day you wake up waking up is painful and then you're waking up and you've got a responsibility and then anytime you sit up and say hey man it sure is tough like that all you get is i'll pray for you girl it's gonna be better i'm gonna lift you up in prayer hey Prayer has its place, but you preach your best sermons through the actions you take. You do your best, your, your, your best evangelism and representation of God by how you engage his creation. Sisters are hurting. Brothers hurting too. Telling them to suck it up. Telling them, shoot, I got to do it. Telling them, you don't know where they've been. Everybody's got a different threshold because everybody started in a different place. And everybody's been through different things. You may be doing what she's doing, but you may not have been what, the, what she's been through. Then you may have been through what she's been through and it hardened you. To, you're just waking up every day and, and living. You're doing it. But the, the, the best part of life, you're not even experiencing it. And the worst thing is you don't even know it. What do I mean? You can be so hard that you're waking up doing things and you're convinced that, hey, this is life. I'm good. I go here at least twice a year. I do this. My kids got this. I do that. I ain't worried about none of that bull crap. And you don't realize the best part of this life is experiencing from the deepest recesses of your soul where you feel enjoyment and fulfillment. And the only way that you could ever feel it at its truest level is you have to be open to pain. If you're not open to being hurt, you haven't felt life. You haven't really truly lived it. You've shut off from it. And you don't realize it, but a part of you is already dead. So that's why it's easy to look at somebody who's about to die, literally, and talk about why, you know, uh, it wouldn't be you and what's the big deal. We've lost our compassion because we haven't experienced it in any grand sense of thing. We really and truly are so callous because we have wallowed in the pain so much that our scar tissue has covered up our entire soul. We got to start caring for one another on a level that when we hear something's going on, we rise to the challenge. The village has died. The village is burnt down. And it's every man for itself. And when you get that, you get the weak, I mean, the strong feeding on the weak. The weak throwing in the towel. And total chaos. My challenge is to you, my people, that we rise above it. That we rise above it. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I challenge you. to do something different as I said in the beginning if you feel blessed, encouraged, inspired uh, informed click the like button share button subscribe or follow if you believe in the work we're doing in the community through programs like Black Men Leave Restoring Ghettos Forgotten Daughters our research program, our think tank the things that we use to create solutions to all of these issues if you want to help us be better resource to reach out to people who are struggling with depression, who are struggling with psychosis, who are struggling with schizophrenia, oh, we got all kind of stuff going on. I got teenage boys having suicidal ideations. If you want to support the work we're doing, look in the description box. Click the link and give. On that note, look, I'm about to get ready to get away from this desk for a minute, try to unwind myself. Uh, reel myself in because this stuff really matters to me. I go to bat because I, I care. And so I, I'm training myself and this is actually coming from one of my clients who told me, I've got to step back. I've got to start taking care of me. I need to fill my tank uh, again because it doesn't get filled a lot. So I've got to fill my tank. But what I'm going to tell you is we need you. We need your support. We need you to give. But we need you to be aware. We need you to know we need you to care. 
We need you to be a part of the solution. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. As you guys always know, I live my life on full so that when I leave this place, I die on E. I challenge you to do the same thing. I'm out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be free.